Can you bring everything you've seen to your mind? Sure. Even if it were uh, an everyday object like, uh, say, shoes? I see all the shoes I've worn, and my mother's, and other people I've met, and you have three pairs. One is a new heel, and there's shoes in newspaper ads, and TV ads, and... Wow. Can't you? Oh, man, I wish I could. That would be an amazing thing. Oh, so good. But alas, most of us can't. Everybody and welcome to the Cinema Psych Podcast, the podcast where psychology meets film. I am your host, Dr. Alex Wan, and in this episode, we are going to chat about Temple Grandin. No, not the person, although this person is real. She is real. No, we're going to talk about the, the movie that was made based on her life and the titular character the titular real person of temple grandin in this movie is played by the phenomenal claire danes phenomenal claire danes did an amazing job and i'll go into a little bit more uh, about the actors here in just a second but just to give you some background temple grandin is a person who has autism and it currently on the faculty at Colorado State University, I believe, and uh, in like agricultural science and things like that, because she's very well known for her not only her autism advocacy, but also for her um, work in making more humane conditions for cattle on cattle ranches and cattle farms and and slaughterhouses and things like that. But she is pretty important in not only uh that field i mean some may say very important as as an academic goes but also in this environment of autism and especially how autism was viewed in the 50s 60s 70s 80s it's just it, it's been a lot the movie itself is based on two books that she herself wrote, Temple Grandin herself wrote, her memoirs, Emergence, and then um, Thinking in Pictures. And Thinking in Pictures is probably the more famous of the two. Um, Thinking in Pictures was recreated as a children's book. The movie also has some great performances nominated performances some of them won of course claire danes did win an emmy for this tv movie and then also a screen actors guild award uh for her portrayal of temple grandin and i think the award that she won perhaps um in the hearts and minds is she got a hug from temple grandin and that's one of the features of the movie is that temple herself struggles with contact and 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 hugging and uh typical uh human to human contact and and Claire Danes got a hug from Temple after they sat for 6 hours discussing over lunch the Temple's life and how to portray someone with autism Claire Danes does not have autism but um, Temple, uh, Temple really stood behind Claire and uh, wanted her to portray this role. Although, to be fair, Temple did think that Sigourney Weaver was going to play her uh, because they are of similar height. Temple is actually a very tall woman and um, eventually went to Claire Danes. Uh, a couple of different writers for uh, this, uh, the rest of the screenplay, Christopher Monger and Margaret Scariano, or Scariano, excuse me. And the director is Mick Jackson, who also won a um, Director's Guild Award or some <clears throat> uh, award related to 
I can't, I don't remember exactly uh, what he himself won for this movie, but he did win for his direct uh, directing. Julie Ormond plays Temple's mother, nominated uh, for the Emmy, and I believe she won over her uh, supporting actress counterpart, her, the woman who plays her sister, uh, Aunt Anne, Catherine O'Hara. David Strathairn is one of the formative people in her life in high school, Dr. Carlock, uh, who teaches Temple more or less a solid lesson in what the meaning of life is and what happens when we die and and uh, all of these kinds of things. Um, not a, a bunch of other well-known names. I mean, you can look on the IMDb here and, and look through and and uh, see all of the people who give her guff in her life. And of course, that's what we're going to be talking about in this episode. So let's chat Temple Grandin. My guest host today is Dr. Sarah Bagley, returning to the show with another film. If you're not familiar, Sarah is an associate professor of psychology at Lindenwood University in St. Charles, Missouri. Her area of expertise is behavioral neuroscience, but teaches classes in research, statistics, learning memory, sensation, and perception. Pretty much most of the classes that I teach, too. Sarah, welcome back to the show. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me back to chat. Of course, of course. The last time we chatted was when we talked about the great film Awakenings, and you are back with uh, another film. We'll get to that one in just a second. So for those of you who are listening anew to the show, go take a look at episode 33. Uh, Go listen to that one because we had a great time last year talking about it and i did say last year so sarah what have you been up to how's your semester going oh it's going well i mean oh goodness i think back to the last time that we chatted and it really feels like just yesterday I know. um <laughs> I know. it's crazy how time flies the older we're getting indeed um well the last year has been good the semester has been good i feel like as we go back from pandemic teaching to in person for majority of my classes i've been trying to use a lot of creative energy in my classroom so I've really focused on what is the draw of the classroom experience, yeah. which I prefer and I keep hearing that my students prefer to. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to do things very unique or something they haven't experienced yet. So having in-person classroom debates or having an escape room. That was really fun at my behavioral neuroscience That's final awesome. exam uh, last semester. Did they make I've it had out? students... They did. Okay, good. They varied in time. <laughs> gotcha. I will let you know, but they did all make it out um, within the end of our finals time. So um, there's been other things like service learning and trying to connect some of our students to the community. Mm-hmm. And I also chair different committees on our campus, one of which is our academic showcase that we hold every year in April. So that's mm-hmm. been really fun um, to showcase all the wonderful things that are doing on our campus. And I've been overseeing some student researchers, so getting them excited. Some of their most recent projects have been looking at internal experiences of things like mental imagery. So visualizing in your mind, as well as being able to hear things just within our mind. So hear things just within your mind. Ah, I love that. The inner voice, the the monologuers, as uh, the Mm -hmm. media likes to refer to it as I, I use monologuers because I am yeah. constantly talking to myself in my head. Um, they're they're that. great soliloquies. They're Shakespeare level. Um, that's really cool. Inner voice, inner images. That's that's awesome. It sounds like you've been really busy. And yes, I, it's like, little, I'm sure uh, many of us. Bit. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit. You know. But you know what? I would say, actually, uh, when you do what you love, it just it doesn't feel like work. It right. feels like living your passions. So I agree. I, I strongly agree. And I've had a lot of fun. And you, you bring up a good point about what 
what makes the classroom experience so important. And so that's an, that's one thing that I'm working on as well as I go through my rotation of courses and making sure that I'm making the courses worth doing and not, um, you know, something that online. Although I will say that we are in, we got a grant to work on online courses. So we are oh, cool. sort of doing both. And I put in, I put in a couple of proposals for that. So we'll see. We'll see. But let's pivot to our chat today. So like I said last time, you brought a great movie in Awakenings and you came back with a fantastic suggestion for coming on the show again. What made you choose Temple Grandin for our chat today? Well, when you contacted me that we should do this again, I was really excited. And I was thinking back to different movies that I've used in my courses. Mm -hmm. And this one just really stuck out. It was a display of a truly unique and remarkable human. Mm -hmm. Um, And based on her life story, this movie really takes us on a visual depiction of what the mind of Temple Grandin is like, as best we can understand it. Sure. Um, So from the use of actual images that might be in her mind to to lead her to her accomplishments and the voice of a person with high functioning autism. So she's a world renowned autism spokesperson Mm -hmm. and consultant to the livestock industry. Yep. She understands animal behavior. Like many of us could only dream of if that's what you dream of. (laughs) So she's and I remember watching this movie and just being in shock at her story Mm -hmm. as well as how she has change things in the world yeah it was quite the uh knowledge uh giver in her impact on the cattle and livestock industry Mm -hmm. uh you think i mean for for someone of of my age uh i don't know a, a world that's different after her changes right i don't i don't know what yeah. cattle and livestock's lives were like uh prior to her changes it's quite quite wild you know i was talking with my uncle after first watching this movie who has been a uh crop assessor in iowa for mm-hmm. i mean he retired from that profession and this was well over 10 years ago and I said, have you ever heard of Temple Grandin? And he goes, oh, yeah, you should have seen it before before some of her um, things have, had come to fruition. So, it, yeah, that's it, so amazing. She's impacted many people's lives. And she's one of us. Uh, so Sarah and I are faculty members. She is also a faculty member. And I think that's tr- also amazing, right? <laughs> to deal with yeah. all the random stuff that we do, but, but also having a whole different life as a, an autism advocate, going on speaking tours, giving TED Talks, uh, writing books, and doing all of this kind of stuff just about her own life. Like, that's what she talks about. It's not like she's talking about um, somebody else's autistic life or patients or clients or anything like that. She's talking about herself. And then she has this faculty life <laughs> where mm-hmm. she's teaching people about uh, livestock management and uh, all of that kind of stuff. I think it's Truly I mean, amazing. It's amazing where you can go in life with a degree, an undergraduate degree in psychology. I, exactly. I mean, uh, if you so go, many different fields. If you go look at her um, Wikipedia page, the real Temple Grandin's Wikipedia page, um, she had she got a, a bachelor's uh, in, of science from Franklin Pierce College. Um, is that Franklin Pierce University now, or is it still Franklin Pierce College? That I don't know. You know, I'm not certain. But she, you, as you said, she got a, an undergraduate degree, Bachelor of Science in Psychology, and she really connected with a horse uh, in high school um, and realized with her work at uh, on her uh, aunt's farm where she created this hugging machine very similar to the machine used to steady cattle um really gave gave her the mindset like i can make uh cattle lives better which is yeah. which is really awesome and then so she got a masters in that uh in like agricultural science or something like that 
and then went and got her PhD to further that research. And she's been phenomenal ever since. So with that in mind, uh, just to give a, a brief breakdown of the synopsis here. So the movie itself follows uh, Claire Danes' portrayal of Temple Grandin from a teenager in high school to a uh, sort of middle adulthood into the 1980s. So we we follow her as she navigates high school, as she navigates college, almost being kicked out of college uh, for things that we'll mention in, in just a little bit. Um, and then following her through her master's program, we don't see anything beyond that. So we don't see her going for a doctorate. The end of the, the, the movie ends with her sort of big triumphant moment, um, with respect to, uh, the, uh, cattle movement down into a chute to get them cleaned off from all the bugs and stuff, a little dunk, dunk, uh, shoots uh and um and then her her redesign of slaughterhouses uh conveyor for you know one cow at a time so we we follow this and there are a couple of flashbacks to her um childhood where we follow really what's happening with her her mother and how her mother sort of um uh, deals with the differences that that temple has especially autism and then to her time on her aunt's farm and all of those things. So that's essentially the synopsis. We just follow a series of vignettes at, in these very various time points. And, and Sarah, you had a, a, a great sort of encapsulation um, following one yeah. of the things that you do in your classes. So what did you uh, make of the progression of the movie? So I almost feel as this, so this movie ha- is two movies in one. The first portion of the movie is following her developmental trajectory up until college. And they make a big significant moment of doors are open. Mm-hmm. And that's about the time that I pause the movie and have good discussion with my students, put them into groups, ask various things about her life trajectory. And I also ask them, where do you think she goes from there? Mm-hmm. And it's across the board. If they have never heard of Temple Grandin, but I mean, sky's the limit on what they could come up with. And almost none of them pick the path that she does go on into the animal husbandry and understanding slaughterhouses and how animal behavior works. And um, it's interesting because the second half of the movie is how she really goes out of the norm kind of defies some stereotypes and and really some sexism right. as she breaks into an industry that not many people are caring about how these animals are treated. But there's an interesting juxtaposition as she really does care and she's very passionate about it. So it's almost a second half of the movie where you get to explore and see where her life goes up until the point of the end of the movie. Right. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, (laughs) I think that's great. It's a it's a great look at um, her progression through the events of the movie. So this film is about Temple Grandin, a person with autism, and there are a handful of films in American film history that explore this a lot of discussion and 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 this um particular movie that I'm thinking of has been on the show before we, we I've talked about it and that's Rain Man and it is great. a great movie but a poor portrayal of yes. autism um more along the lines of who the the character of Raymond was based on and and this person was not autistic. But Temple Grandin is sort of, and especially at the time this movie came out, which was about 12 years ago, um, sort of a, a very big advocate and spokesperson for autism. Um, and at the end of the movie, you see her sort of jump into that role, really sort of taking that to use a, a pun that I thought of just now, taking the bull by the horns. 
Um, <laughs> uh, and really uh, sort of going headfirst into that one. Again, she mentions one of the lines that she says throughout the movie, which is it's, a, it's just another door opening, right? It's just another door. Think of it as a door. A door that's going to open up onto a whole new world for you. And what's what's really poignant about the end of the movie, I know we're talking at the end before we talk about everything in between. <laughs> sure. But she uh, is in a room full of people who are primarily parents or mm-hmm. caregivers of people with autism that let, let's just give a kind of a definition. Yeah, for that sounds great. As familiar with it. So autism spectrum disorder is a neurological disorder that affects the functioning of the developing brain. So we have this diagnosed in early years of life yep. resulting typically in communication, social and cognitive deficits, including including theory of mind. So being able to, so theory of mind is being able to perspective shift Mm -hmm. and understand the thoughts, feelings, and just insights another person may have. Right. Yeah. So when you have a deficit in that, social impairments are very, very common. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, sorry, it was Temple with her autism she is very high functioning and was able to be very communicative and willing to speak up in this room full of people who the caregivers didn't fully understand what their children or even adults around them were experiencing. And she could give it a voice and people in the movie ask her like, how old is your child? Yes. I was just going to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah, she says, I, I have autism. And they sort of momentarily, they sort of momentarily boo her when she says, I don't have any kids. Yeah. Um, and she's like, you what are you talking anything. about? And, I have autism. And she, yes, and they're like, oh, you you hear the gasps and mm-hmm. um, just the one woman who was, was struggling with the speaker prior to uh, Temple speaking up comes and hands her the microphone. Like, <laughs> First of all, still doesn't ungra- fully grasp what that means for a person with autism. But then also, like, please continue to share your experiences. We need to know that there is something more to 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 know. Rolling on the floor, flapping. Well, I think spinning is good. And then rolling too. Self stimulation does seem to eventually calm the nervous system. It can be a way to compensate for not being held. And being held by another person is scary, but but rolling or or being held by surfaces produces the calming effect that ordinary children get from a hug. How old's your child? Well, I don't have children. Oh. No, I'm autistic. And I need the sensation of being hugged. And I've developed a machine that I get into and hugs me, and I'm different afterwards. I'm more social. Well, I didn't speak until I was four. Now I have a BA and a master's, and I'm studying for my doctorate. How do you learn to speak? Please don't shout. Please don't shout. Uh, mo- most autistic people are very sensitive to, to sounds and colors. Overstimulation hurts. You know, people talking too much at once, you know, can cause us to panic. How did you get cured? Well, I'm not cured. I'll always be autistic. My mother refused to believe that I wouldn't speak. And when I learned to speak, she made me go to school. And in school and at home, manners and rules were really important. They were pounded into me. I was lucky. All these things worked for me. Everyone worked hard to make sure that I was engaged. And they knew I was different, but not less. Now I had a gift. I could see the world in a new way. I could see details that other people were blind to. My mother pushed me to become self-sufficient. I worked summers in my aunt's ranch. I went to boarding school and college. Those things, those things were uncomfortable for me at first, but they helped me to open doors to new worlds. Excuse me, please, but we want to hear everything. Yeah. As you mentioned, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, but it's not like we've known about this idea and all of the uh, issues on the spectrum 
for very long um, in in a very uh, poignant scene, flashback scene, we're in the early 1950s in a doctor's office and um, Temple is four years old and has not yet spoken and is still exploring the world around her, doing all of these sort of, um, and and the filmmaking in this in this movie is phenomenal. I can't, I can't overstate this enough. As a film nerd, holy crap, these are amazing <laughs> visuals to sort of clue you in to the mind of mm-hmm. Temple. And so we're in this office where Temple is doing all of these, as a four-year-old, doing all of these visual things in her mind. And the doctor is explaining to this uh, to this woman, um, her mother, that she has autism. Although I think that's a bit anachronistic, as you as, as you and and I have both pointed out in our notes here. They probably would not have diagnosed Temple no. with autism no. in the early 1950s. No. Um, and f- speaking of the diagnosis that the doctor gives, he sort sort of explains it as um, this is your fault, mother, um, yes. that you have been cold and aloof and distant towards your child. And that's why she hasn't started speaking. Oh, and this, her poor mother who had other children without autism yeah. just could not kind of wrap her brain around the fact that, why did this happen to one? Like yeah. I have mothered all of my children in very similar ways. So, yeah. I mean, props to her. She does everything within her power to try and get uh, Temple, who was not an easy child, to do things like communicate and yeah. at least follow some rules when she didn't understand how or why they were in place. Right. And um, the... The what the doctor is talking about is a theory called the refrigerator mother for, I guess, the coldness of the mother. <laughs> of it's ridiculous. And of course, it was developed by a man named uh, Bruno Bettelheim. Um, I, I wanted to get that out there because um, a, a doctor is mentioned at the end of the movie, Dr. Bernard Rimlin, um, who debunked the refrigerator mother theory with tons and tons and tons and tons of evidence. Um, and then, so as, as, um, the trivia about the movie noted and, and I, I sort of looked up on my own is that Temple actually wasn't diagnosed officially with, uh, autism until she was 63. I mean, the timeline of her life, we have more information um, in the early 2000s that she could have that diagnosis. Right. I thought at one point you had to actually be within the age range of before five years old and not be showing the communication and the social emotional deficits Mm -hmm. in order to formally have that diagnosis. But Mm -hmm. Um, I am not a clinical psychologist. DSM is not something I have memorized. Right, yeah, neither am I. <laughs> turn here. So um, uh, it, I think, is now reflected back if you were experiencing certain things in that developmental time period. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, she was uh, diagnosed at two years old with just, uh, sort of just the catch-all brain damage. And um, what specific divergence was she diagnosed with later? Yeah. You know, it's interesting as a behavioral neuroscientist, I always tell my students that your brain is like your fingerprint. Mm -hmm. We all have them very unique. Right. Now, most of us have fingerprints. They're in a general, typical shape. Mm -hmm. And that is what we typically see in the brain. And when you get someone who has a neurodivergence, they're going to have some unique uniquenesses on their, so to speak, fingerprint that is not typical of other individuals. And what had been found with Temple going in for some brain scans is that she has an enlarged left ventricle. Which is so interesting. So, so interesting. A ventricle is just space in the brain. 
And this is typically filled with cerebral spinal fluid. It has some cushioning aspects, but it's just one of her hemispheres of the brain. And that big space there leads to some more abnormalities in that left hemisphere. And if you know much about brain geography, (laughs) the left hemisphere typically handles language and may have accounted with some difficulties she has with processing words. Mm -hmm. And to make up for this, the right hemisphere tends to overcompensate. And that could lead to some special unique abilities, usually seen in people with savants. So people who are savant, which Temple also has that diagnosis, is that, which you could have that independent. Um, A savant is a person who has like an island of genius. Mm -hmm. And Temple has this with her eidetic memory. So her visual memory and the, the capability for her to visually remember almost every picture or scene she's ever witnessed in her life. So while, you know, you sort of take some aspects of not being able to connect in an empathetic way or relate of other people's vantage points, Mm -hmm. she does have this amazing capability. Yeah. And, and she, uh, she explains this, rather uh strikingly when she's talking with Dr. Carlock and and um after Chestnut one of the horses uh dies and he says it's best not to think about Chestnut anymore thinking you know that's the appropriate thing to say to a a kid experiencing death um kids can experience death um in many ways and it's it's not as Tragic as adults think it will be or traumatic uh, as adults think it will be. And she says, what are you talking about? I have seen Chestnut in this and this and this and this and just rattles off um, all of the horses that that she's seen in her entire life yeah. that look yeah. like a brown horse. I don't know what kind of horse Chestnut was. Yeah. Um, and then he Carlock asks, well, what about shoes and on the screen flashes all of the shoes she has worn in her life flashing and and it's supposed to rep- represent her memory just bringing all of those shoes back to her visual short term memory it's it's amazing you know what i forget shoes i have in my own closet right now so <laughs> it's yes. one of those things where you're like wow my entire life like that that would just be the superpower and i do call it kind of a superpower oh yeah i when i go over um memorists who have these abilities i refer to them as super memorists and i tell mm-hmm. my students that many of the the things that um super memorists can do they can do with enough time and effort but of course things like eidetic memories and and um what temple can do and what she's described but herself and and by others to be able to do with visual memory is perhaps not attainable by the vast majority of us um and which makes her super powered yes she is a superpower she has a superpower 100 percent. plays with toys dolls she loves to rip things and no speech yet at the age of four she's four no, not yet. I'm sure it's just a face, but... Uh, Your child is clearly autistic. Autistic. I'm, I'm not familiar. She's an infantile schizophrenic. Infantile. Um, so, so when would she grow out of it? I mean, what's the next step for... We generally recommend an institution. Oh, for how long? I'm not sure I would like that. I really, I I wouldn't want to miss her first words. She probably will never speak. And I'm afraid there is no course of treatment. I'm talking about institutionalization. But, um, I mean, she, she was a perfectly normal baby and then later she changed. So I need to know how, why. I'm not sure you don't. 
Perhaps if you had your husband call me. My husband is a very busy man, and I graduated from Harvard, so why don't you try me? I'm, I'm sorry. It's been suggested that it may be a lack of bonding with the mother. That at a crucial phase, the mother was cold, aloof, when the child most needed physical affection. But that is not what happened. We have another child, and she is not like this, and I did not do anything different. <laughs> Temple rejects me. I, I want to hug her and she won't let me. I'm supposed to have done this. Well, then I can undo it. You just tell me what to so, do. So, let's said, talk about the uh, societal impacts on Temple's life. So, we start with her. So, of course, I just mentioned the doctor's office visit where, you know, she's got autism. Well, what is autism? And so on and so forth, right? Um, and it's going to be a struggle. We see her, we see her mother try to sh teach her speaking. We don't actually get the Helen Keller moment, uh, in the movie. So from Mil a miracle worker, for those of you who had to watch that in elementary school or something, <laughs> um, we don't have that, you know, water and sign language moment, but she eventually learns how to speak and we move on from there. So what's the first big obstacle that Temple faces. Well, we find that she has this moment where she is in in a really intense anger situation from being at her aunt's farm. Mm -hmm. And she was really hoping it to be the room she stays in was her bedroom. Mm -hmm. So she even put her name and taped it onto the door. And by happenstance, this falls off of the door. And she has just severe panic mm -hmm. develop in, in her. And leading up to this, she had noticed on the farm that the cattle were going into something called a squeeze machine. That if they, right before they were going to get some sort of vaccination or shot, they were squeezed and it comforted them. Mm -hmm. So Temple, being in this very panicked moment, goes to the first thing that she I presume most recently remembers or thinks might comfort her. Uh -huh. And that's the squeeze machine. Yeah. She literally goes out to the squeeze machine. And of course, from an outside perspective, many people in their ignorance would think that that's an odd thing to do, right? That, yeah. Like, I mean, it is definitely not something you see every day, right? nor would many people think that is the first thing if I'm having a panicked moment, very emotional and intense, that that would give me some sort of relief. Right. And it, it becomes something that becomes very comforting for her. Right. And I think it has to do with that tactile pressurization in, in giving her a different sense. Mm -hmm. um, commonly you see people with autism have almost over over sensitive sensory modalities mm -hmm. so what may seem like a typical lighting level might seem too intense for mm -hmm. someone with autism yeah. same with noise and i i think a appropriate amount of stimulation is really what is going to help comfort someone and it's got to be per the individual. Yeah. So it's not a one size fits all. Right. But you do find that in even neurotypical individuals that if someone's having a bad moment, giving them a hug can comfort them. Indeed. Yeah. So she, the cattle squeezer may have given her the oxytocin she needed to calm down. Right. Um, where a neurotypical person would get that from an embrace of a loved one or a friend, maybe even a stranger. Um, Temple got it from this cattle thing, and it and it, the 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 cattle squeezer sort of follows her in her journey. Um, sh when she gets to college, she makes one herself, and they don't understand it. And there's a gr uh, really great and yet maddening scene where she's meeting with a psychiatrist who is a hundred percent a Freudian. 
uh, psychiatrists in, in, I guess, what that would be like the late 60s, I think it was. So somebody with either psychoanalytic or psychodynamic background, and they're asking questions that she doesn't understand. She takes them literally, whereas in that therapy modality you're not supposed to take things literally. You're supposed to take them euphemistically and she don't understand euphemism. So she agrees with what he's saying that it brings her pleasure. And he, he is not being um, clear enough, which I think is a knock on that doctor, not being clear enough by what he means by pleasure. He thinks he's using, uh, he thinks she's using it for sexual pleasure. She just knows that it makes her feel better better and that equates to pleasure for her and of course they toss it and she tries to toss it into garbage she tries to get it back into her room they're like we're gonna we're gonna toss you out and and she says and 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 her aunt Anne comes and is like this is what she needs to calm herself down and um successfully convinces them that she's gonna do a psych experiment and of course, she blows her professor away. Of course, who wouldn't? Right? She did appropriate groups and time in the squeeze machine and time out of the squeeze machine. She collected the data and she showed significant changes by it being helpful to not only her, mm -hmm. but other individuals as well. You know, I think, too, uh, my dog has some anxiety, especially around the 4th of July time yeah. when there's fireworks and loud booms all the time. Yeah. And some. Sometimes it sounds like we're in a war zone where we live <laughs> with all of the fireworks. But he has this thing called a thunder coat, and that is works exactly the same way. It is a coat that's very like, tightly wrapped around mm -hmm. him, and he does get comfort. And so even if it's in one sensory modality for him, loud noises, mm -hmm. the squeezing has this wonderful effect. So it's very it's, cool. It, those it those jackets only are work great. in animals, but yeah. in humans. Uh, although Sometimes. people have reported feeling more calm under weighted blankets, so if yes. they use weighted blankets to sleep in or something like, or take naps in, they feel more comforted because I, I mean, it's something about something about being embraced. I think is a, a mammals apparently seem to enjoy this, right? So uh, and then we move on from college and she has the uh, experience of just massive amounts of sexism on a uh, cattle ranch, a feeding, a feeding ranch where um, she realizes that they need to make some changes, but needs to get in there. And then she also needs to get them to sign off on her master's thesis, according to her advisor. Uh, this, by the way, I don't know. I just, uh, as an aside, I was like, needs to sign off for this master's thesis. What is going on at this master? It was like in this master's program. I felt as though the advisor was like, yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> and then she finally gets the, you know, the, the master's thesis signed off on and it's just. It's really gross and dirty and has probably cow pies on it. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, of course, because she's been on the cattle um, farm, farming cattle. Yeah. But of course, I can only imagine the smells that were also seeping through this master's thesis. But... <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man, it would probably smelled awful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> down and, and especially because this ranch is in Arizona, right? And so it's really mm -hmm. hot. But. She tackles that sexism really well. She like it takes the fact that she has short hair and she has sharp features, jawline, all of that stuff, and just looks around at all of the trucks. She sells her beetle, her her VW bug, and gets a massive, you know, Chevy truck or Ford truck, whatever it was. Um, and, uh, goes and gets overalls. I love how she just rolls in the mud just to get them dirty so they don't look new. 
Well, she also had this idea from the very beginning of the movie of she had watched a TV show about a cowboy. And when she was on her aunt's farm, is he a cowboy? Mm -hmm. So she has this visual image over time of what a cowboy looks like. Yeah. And she's kind of working her way to resemble this idea in her head of a cowboy Mm -hmm. because that's kind of where she's going. She's going to be a cowboy. If a cowgirl's not allowed, she's going to be a cowboy. So yeah, she does, does everything to get in there. It's very creative in her, her mindset there. Yeah. And she succeeds even though, and I thought this was going to be the main like conflict of the movie. Um, there is no like main conflict of the movie, but these cowboys don't really care when she develops this like winding um, dip uh, funneling system that is more, uh, I-, I guess, humane. more humane and helpful, keeps the cows calm. They don't need to get shocked or anything like this. And they go into the dip and they get they get that uh, that treatment that gets all the bugs off of them and everything. And then they just like take it apart and end up killing three three cows. And then she gets blamed. Yeah, yeah, she gets blamed for killing the three cows when her design was working fine and other people altered it so that it it became. And she goes up to the she goes up to the guy and is like, y- y- your guys are stupid. Like she said, like she said stupid, like four or five times stupidity or stupid, like four or five times. It was it was great because they all deserved that label. They um they were cowboys. They didn't have an idea of what um, the cows actually needed. She did. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting perspective shift. So typically what you see with people with autism is they don't have this theory of mind. Mm-hmm. Being able to realize if you just stubbed your toe, what does that feel like for you mm-hmm. versus watching that experience? And you see earlier in the movie that she's actually analyzing pictures of different emotions because she's not she needs to put a label to what these emotions are because she doesn't feel it when other people are feeling it. Mm -hmm. But what she can do is understand how the cow's eyes and how their ears and how their feet work and how if they turn in circles, they stay calm Mm -hmm. as though they're, they're being herded and how their feet work and they're just swimming through the dip as they don't jump off into the pool, but instead they continue walking as though they feel like they're still there. And she can, take these circumstances and have theory of mind for animals and the functionality of how how they could stay calm so it's this interesting juxtaposition of not being able to relate in that way to other humans but she can with other animals which i think again is an amazing superpower yeah and and she uses it very well. I mean, the real Temple Grandin, I think, has had a if you take away all of the um, autism advocacy, of course, not discounting that. But if you were to put that to the side and just viewed her academic work, phenomenal academic work, changed the industry, 100 percent changed the industry. Um, now, you can put that down as a legacy, right? That oh, that sure. all that by itself is yes. a legacy. And they show that in the in the movie quite well because the final uh sort of blockade um and the final vignette before the the end of the movie sort of shifts to her autism advocacy um is her developing uh plants, just plants from watching an architect um, plans for a more humane and orderly slaughterhouse. Um, now say what you will about you know, the slaughtering of animals for people's food. That's not what we're talking about here. I don't know what um, temples uh, Grandin's views, the real temple Grandin's views are on that, but she wanted to make it a more humane. She, I, I think she understood that people eat meat, and they will continue to eat meat. And so how can we do this to where the animals are not dying in um, pain and misery? 
And so she designs this whole thing. I have this quote at the end of the movie where Temple says, nature is cruel, but we don't have to be. I wouldn't want to have my guts ripped out by a lion. I'd rather die in a slaughterhouse if it was done right, which has so many contradictions. Because if you think about the natural order of things, of course, a lion ripping your guts out because you are too slow seems more adequate, (laughs) but also quite painful, um, rather than going to a slaughterhouse and staying calm up to the point that you're terminal and it's all done. Right. You have no sensation yeah. or feeling of that end of life. So it's it's fascinating. This looks like an airport for cows. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I didn't mean that as a compliment. And conveyor belts for cattle? <laughs> Do you have any idea what the cost is on this? And you've got solid walls and floors? We have those slatted for a reason. It's cheaper. I'm sorry, Miss Grant, and it's clear you just don't have the experience to design something like this. The walls are solid, so the cattle won't be distracted by light or movement outside. They balk at unexpected things. I'm sure that's nice for the cattle, but the cost, Miss... How much money does it cost you to pay handlers to prod the cattle along and then hold them back when they stampede? How many times a day do your shoot stop because of pileups? How many cows break a leg and bring everything to a halt? With my system, there'd be none of that. There'd be a steady, calm flow. Well, that sounds great, but you don't have any idea whether it'll work. But I do. I'm like Nikola Tesla or Thomas Edison. I I know my system will work because I've been through it a thousand times in my head. I can see a shoot just as a cattle will because that's something my autism lets me do. I can walk through a plan in my mind, examining every beam and every rivet. Well, you just see a plan, but I'm walking through the whole plant. Okay, the cattle go through a series of solid curves, and the floor is solid too, grooved. The chute gets smaller, but the cattle won't mind. They don't don't see any danger. They think they're just getting into another truck. The stairway leads them gently upwards. The floor becomes a conveyor. A rest rises up to meet their chests, so they're comfortably carried. They'll be very calm. And 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 so in this room with all of these slaughterhouse slaughterhouse execs, she's introducing her plan, and they're like, "Well, do you know how much this will cost, little lady, young lady? This is too expensive. You can't have a a uh, a solid floor, flat floor. I mean, blah blah blah. You can't have this conveyor system. That would cost too much." And then she's like, "Well, listen." How much money do you lose when a uh, one cow makes a commotion and then causes the rest of the herd to make a commotion? Um, Cows die before they get to the actual slaughterhouse because of terrible treatment and and, uh, terrible conditions. And it's like one thing after another. And that she convinces them. It's worth it. This is actually more cost effective. So humane, cost effective, just changing the whole industry. And I don't think there is a slaughterhouse in existence anymore that went with her, the ways before Temple's ideas. I think they have been changed completely. Yeah, I mean, she's been she's been at it for several Mm -hmm. decades now, um, and she's been solid in that. We have five minutes left. He wants to see a movie. Yeah. Yeah. JD, will you do the projector? Okay. All right, now everybody watch very carefully because this one is all about optical illusions. It comes as a distinct shock to most people when they realize how limited and how inaccurate the human senses really are. In this house, Faces at the window seem to come in assorted sizes, don't they? It looks they? like Mr. Povey, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, there's nothing wrong with the faces. It's those windows and what they're doing to your brain. All right, here we go. A small one and a tall one. Mm-hmm. Let's see if we can even things out a bit. How'd you do that? Oh, no. yeah. 
Uh, yeah, Temple, sit down, please. That is the question, isn't it? How did they do that? Hmm? Well, that's this week's assignment. Mm -hmm. I want one page, at least. A whole page? page? All right, two. No, no, no. All right, one page. You mess up the perspective. That's right, Temple. And it was a room built with distorted perspective. But how? Well, do you think you could figure it out? Maybe if you visualized it? And if you build one, I'll give you extra credit. Yeah, okay. A couple of notes that I wanted to put before we um, before we end here. Uh, going back to the filmmaking, and Sarah, you raised this point a, a little bit ago with um, the over and hyper sensitivity to sensations. So again, a along with the visual cues, of course, we can't be uh, we can't. Uh, forget to mention her big high school project of creating an Ames room from just a reference video. That's wild. Most of us would need, um, most of us would need like plans. <laughs> the the plans for an Ames room. And if you're not familiar, listener, with what the Ames room is, it is a room that is constructed in sort of a trapezoidal uh, configuration where features of the room, like windows and doors and all kinds of things, are arranged in such a way that look normal when viewed through a limited viewing angle, like a peephole. And when objects or people, if made large enough, are in this room at different corners, they will look as though they are miniature or large, because our eyes focus on the normal features of the room, like windows. And not, and our visual system is more tuned to those regularities as opposed to things that change, like things that move. People who come closer or nearer to us get bigger or smaller. And so, in this room where the floor is slanted and it's the walls are trapezoidal, um, people in one corner will look very, very tiny compared to this window or door or desk or whatever. And people on the other side uh, of the corner of the room will look massive yeah, that, because of the way the perspective yeah, that changes, linear perspective right? and being able to have the size consistency that we would expect and, and seeing someone physically transform as they walk across the room. I think it's so interesting when, um, Temple's character is first shown that movie in what slide projector form. Like that takes you yeah. back to a certain time period. Um, <laughs> and she is just like dumbfounded. And she goes to her te high school teacher is like, how do they do that? And he turned it right back on her and said, how do they do that? Like, keep trying, keep trying to figure out, keep trying to figure out. And she has this insight moment that's portrayed. Yeah. And she just figures it out, makes her own. It's so yes, delightful. It's, it's really cool how she figures it out. And, and the only cl extra clue that he gives her is don't forget all of the other things in the room. It's not just the perspective and the dimensions of the room. It's everything else in the room. And she's like, oh, my That's gosh, it. that is it. Um, but in addition to that, you had mentioned about the sounds and things like that. So that's the Ames room. I also did want to mention um, the the way that the filmmakers use the sound sensitivity. So in in a very parallel fashion to how um Temple describes how she knows where horses are looking and where the cows are looking is where their ears are. And um, very similarly, when things get louder on the soundtrack, it's what Temple is looking at. Um, and it's a, a way to show how the, um, the environment is differently perceived by this person with autism. So the loud fan, the the buzzing of various objects, the clanking or the mooing, which is re really initially clues are into 
the cowboys not doing a very good job of hurting you know the 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 prodding with the um cow prods the electric uh, shock cow prods um are really hurting and so the the cows are trying to communicate with one another and nobody cares it just sounds like you're on a cow farm she realizes that because she's attending to it because the sounds are very loud for her uh she she's able to get clued into that and then start making oh they're moving in circles and, which, and curves and things like that it's really is, very very well done oh, job fantastic the job but it's also curious when we talk about autism spectrum disorder as sensory modalities and having this amplification or heightening or or even a dampening depending on which end of the spectrum for which modality but I, I often wonder, and I think there might have been some connections already in the field of, is it really attentional processing? Like most of us can mm-hmm. filter out the cows moving. If I, if I hear cows mooing all day long, like the cowboys, or, right, the cows are just mooing again. But if it's if yeah. it's brought to my attention and I really start thinking about the pitch and the amplification and how quick they are and which direction they're aimed at, then it brings it to the forefront in this attentional way. And so exactly what these, what you said is the cinematographers have built the amplification through her attention and showed it in mm-hmm. this way. It's fantastic. And, and just a quick and and just an additional point to as far as because film is a is mostly a visual medium um well since the introduction of of sound um it it is also an auditory medium but mostly a, f- a visual medium and um i thought this was an interesting tidbit just to round out this conversation here so filmmakers in general use a lot of camera tricks to um make audiences feel certain ways. So like the use of a Dutch angle, uh, which is an off off um, kilter angle, uh, usually indicates somebody is off with their thinking. So the break from reality, something like that. Um, and I thought this was an interesting thing for this particular movie. So the cinematographer, Ivan Strasberg, used 16 millimeter film, which is a faster film. Um, it, it's, it, uh, reels at a, at a faster rate than what we view films at, which is 24 frames per second, um, on digital on, on these like film cam, I'm not entirely sure what the cameras are, but 60 millimeters faster film. And they use this faster film and operated them handheld as opposed to like being on a on a steady rig or using a gyroscopic steady cam to create this feeling of visual tension and t- to really give you the sense of the same anxiety and panic temple would feel and i think the final cell of this was something that the real Temple Grandin does and Claire Danes mimics really well, which is being very wide-eyed, just having like very big eyes most of the time. Um, and if you've ever seen Temple Grandin talk, uh, like her TED Talk or when she was on the, you know, award circuit with the filmmakers and uh, she made, she I think she spoke um, at uh, the Emmys when Claire Danes won, um, she has these wide eyes. And I think... With the film processing and Claire Dane selling the wide eyed, you get this real big um, uh, angst. An- an- anxious yeah. push, right? Yeah, yeah. Angst. angst. There we go. Yeah, that's a good like one. That's a great word for that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Claire Dane's. Oh my goodness, she completely transforms into Temple Grandin in this movie. I'm thinking back to my younger years, and I'm picturing Claire Danes as Juliet and Romeo and Juliet. I'm like, wow, she is nothing like that character. But this is probably, my so-called oh my life. goodness, my so-called <laughs> life. Or uh, as you recently mentioned, some of her work like in Homeland, like she yeah. takes all of that and just knocks it out of this park in this movie where she's almost like she comes out of her own body and, um, 
takes on Temple's body from her mannerisms, the way she speaks, uh, her gestures and, and just overall, like you said, her eye popping ability to mimic what Temple is like in the flesh. So I, yeah. Ah, props to her. I can understand why it's such an uh, award winning film because Claire and the rest of the crew, the rest of the characters all have done quite a bit of work to try and make this as much of a portrayal as possible with Temple's consultations yeah. all along the way. Yeah, I think it only works with Temple's actual consultation, um, which I don't I don't think the film would have been oh, the same sure. without it. No, it, it couldn't possibly have been. Well, I want to thank Dr. Sarah Bagley for joining me to discuss Temple Grandin, the film, and also the person. Before we say goodbye, Sarah, is there anything that you'd like to plug that you've been recently working on? You know, I have been racking my brains about this. No, no. is that is that an appropriate <laughs> answer? That's all right. Um, you you said just... earlier in the you said earlier in the episode that you know you've you've focused a lot on coming back from you know pandemic sort of teaching. moving on yeah. from the pandemic kind uh, of teaching. I would yeah. just say I'm I am trying to really focus on positive psychology and really, I think in a world that we've been living in since the pandemic, we've lost some of our social connections. So I'm making an extra effort in my life to kind of cheerlead and coach people towards trying to be their best selves, no matter what that best self is, really looking mm-hmm. in, checking in with yourself. Hi, self, how's it going? Um, and saying, <laughs> what do I love? Am I doing that day in, day out? And if I'm not, how do I make myself be a happier person? So I would say uh, that's the only thing that I would really put out there into the world. But That's an okay, amazing plug. <laughs> well perfect Uh, that's wonderful thanks again for joining us Sarah of course and that's going to do it for this episode until the next one thanks for listening 